Well, welcome everybody to this um, OpenShift Commons briefing with Dan McPherson, um, one of my favorite folks on the OpenShift engineering team. Um, and this, as I was saying earlier to, to Dan, this is something we should probably repeat every quarter as new people come on and old people forget some of the, the tips and tricks for using the different development tool chains for OpenShift. And it's really key, I think, to participating in the OpenShift community to understand all the different tools that we use in the, um, the development process and life cycles. So I'm really pleased to have Dan McPherson here today to walk us through some of them. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat room. Um, we'll try, if it does, if there's a pause in Dan talking, we'll, I'll try and read them off. Um, and then we'll save most of them for the end of the conversation and I'll unmute folks and, and let them have a conversation. So without further ado, here's Dan McPherson and um, let's start navigating. Okay, uh, thanks Dan. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, one of the lead engineers on OpenShift. I've actually been working on the product um, pretty much since its inception. Um, I'm going to try to give you guys a, a rundown here of um, basically what it means to be a contributor to OpenShift, both from a um, how do we take requirements as well as um, how we um, build the code and, and actually in, in the end deliver the product. Um, so we're going to start with planning. Um, I will warn you guys, I'm going to be jumping all over the place here, going back and forth between charts and um, various, um, I'm showing you various of the artifacts and, and uh, pieces that we use to build everything. Um, if I go too fast, just yell, I and mean, I'll try and slow down. Okay, so again, starting with planning. Uh, we use Trello for our planning. Uh, we we picked Trello a couple of years ago, um, largely because we, we um, we use an agile process um, where we use three-week sprints. Um, Trello is a pretty generic tool and fit nicely for that, um, but primarily Trello enabled us to be able to share everything we do externally. And we're an open source company. We like to, to uh, make everything we do public, um, and so it was, a, it was a good fit for us. Uh, so actually, I'm gonna actually show you guys that now. So there's a, a few tools here in, in uh, Trello that are worth talking about. So one, everyone can actually see our Trello um, publicly. Um, and it's just that trello.com slash atomic open shift. And this is actually what it looks like whenever um, you are coming externally, even without an ID, I'm not logged in here. Uh, and there's a couple of boards here that are a bunch of boards that are interesting. There's a couple of concepts though. So we first have a roadmap concept, and that's what I'm showing here. And this roadmap concept has basically two main things. There's a an epic backlog of all of the, the big concepts that we're working on, as well as a, a number of lists of what we previously have accomplished for both the 2x time frame and the 3x time frame. And as far as the backlog goes, um, we, we try and maintain this in a rough priority order, although I will um, give the caveat of um, given the, the major rewrite we just did for 3.x, um, the, the priorities was pretty much a matter of we had tons of very, very high priorities. So you will see this over time, um, go back to uh, more of a, here are the next five or six things that are at the top of the list that are most important. Uh, and so for each one of these items, um, it has two main lists in it, um, one list of uh, scenarios and one list of future scenarios. Uh, these lists tend to match up to things that we are working on for the current release versus things that are at some point in the future we will work on them. And uh, there's two types of things in this list. Um, so you have links to other cards, and these cards are uh, on other boards that a given team is working on. And then as well as things that are added in here directly. Uh, and at some point we will, with the items that are added directly, we will come in and convert these to a card and move them to a particular team board. Uh, as far as the ones that are linked to team boards already, um, those are actually uh, automated so that um, whenever they are finished on a team board, um, they will be um, automatically checked off on this list. So we don't actually add the items in here. Um, they're added in automatically with um, a set of scripting that we've built around Trello. Okay, so that's the roadmap board. Um, now I'm going to show you one of the team boards here. Uh, the team boards, we have uh, an, an, a lot of teams, and each of the teams run through roughly the same process. Um, this happens to be our user interface team. And uh, the way this process works, again, we do um, sprinting and agile. And so uh, we basically move everything in here from left to right as things go through the process. So as new requirements come in, they'll be added to the new list. 
Um, these requirements can come from engineers, they can come from product managers, they can come from someone getting an external request and, and coming and adding it in, into Trello directly. And so again, they start on the new list. Um, we do backlog grooming um, once every sprint for each of the teams, at which point the teams will go through the items in the new list, um, decide whether or not they are well formed enough, and if so, move them into the backlog. And the backlog for each team we maintain in a, in a rough priority order. Uh, the next list is basically at the top of that backlog of the things that we're, we're planning on working on for the next milestone. Uh, and then once we get past next, we start working on them to move into in progress, um, complete and accepted our various stages of, of whether or not it's gone through QB. And then the, everything after that is a, a list of um, previous sprints. So that's a, a team board. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Actually, um, I will mention before I do that, um, we do have a summary of this as well. Um, we host a summary um, off of our, our CI environment. Uh, we built this basically for an easy way to uh, get a high level summary of everything that's going across, going on across all the teams. And so there's a few pages here that are interesting. Um, the roadmap overview is essentially a list of what is on the roadmap board I just showed you, um, just in a, in a uh, slightly more verbose format that lets you see everything all on one page. Uh, and then if you want to get an idea of what's happening at a team level, um, going back in time as well, um, we have sprints overview, which for each team here, there's a list of essentially what's currently happening and what has happened over the last few sprints. Uh, the previous sprint overview is basically the same thing except for, for uh, going back further in time. It's not refreshing, right? Okay. Oh, never mind. that's just because uh, that team hasn't quite hasn't been around quite as long. So you can see here the, the team um, goes back as far as uh, December of last year uh, to get a long term history. Uh, actually, the last one I'll show here is the uh, the sprint schedule. So if you want to get an idea of of when our sprint boundaries are, um, you uh, can always uh, refer to this page. And again, there are three week sprints. Um, this basically just shows projecting out through time when those sprints will end. Okay, let me get back to the presentation. Okay, uh, so next up is uh, the development process. Uh, we have a, a lot of options for actually um, developing OpenShift. Uh, the primary two that people actually use for doing development are either using local development, in which case you have to have a machine which can run Git, uh, Go, and Docker. And uh, there's a link here to uh, to uh, the specific instructions to get that set up. And then you can also use Vagrant. Uh, we have Vagrant with uh, VirtualBox and, and Libvirt images uh, published. And that basically lets you do, it, um, do development against any local um, system. And I, I would say even amongst our development team, we probably have a roughly 50-50 split between using uh, either pure local environment running Docker locally or using Vagrant. Uh, and actually, I'm going to go back now and do a little more um, demoing. So actually, uh, what I'm going to show here is a, a really quick example of how simple it is to uh, to get up and started with the Vagrant. Can you um, make your, your font much, much bigger? Yeah, sure. Thanks. That looks great. OK. So yeah, so I am inside of the OpenShift uh, origin Git repo here. And we have a Vagrant file checked into that. Um, there are actually more advanced versions of this um, using a plugin we created um, called Vagrant OpenShift. Um, it's not a requirement. So um, this is going to do a Vagrant up, which is um, by default going to use Fedora. And we also have um, CentOS images published as well. And so what this does is it um, will pull down the image if you haven't already pulled it down, which I have for uh, purposes of this demo. And it will actually mount in your source locally if you have a source locally. Um, if not, you can use source that's on the VM directly. Um, most people tend to prefer local, um, just tends to be how most developers want to work. And so, uh, yeah, so in this case, it's already started up here. And like it's actually showing here, it has mounted in the source. And so, what I'm going to do is uh, SSH to that instance now. And I'm actually going to start up OpenShift. I'm just going to run status on that to make sure it started OK. That does appear that it's running. 
And at that point, um, we actually do port mapping, which it showed whenever it started up, uh, port mapping of all of the interesting ports um, from the instance to your local instance. And so if I go back to the browser here oops, and go to localhost, uh, it will actually have the console running. And so, um, and this is yeah, just OpenShift running uh, inside of uh, inside of that VM port map back to my my local host. So, pretty simple. Um, as far as making changes, like I said, uh, most people would mount the source in, uh, make the changes, and you can, at that point can run builds, and everything is all local. So it's a pretty simple setup to get going. Okay, so a few more things as far as source code um, while we are talking about it. So. Again, our, our primary repo here is the origin repo. Um, there are a number of secondary repos for building images and um, sourced image and a few other external pro or secondary projects um, to origin, but origin is the, the primary one. The origin is what uh, we embed Kubernetes into. Um, mo most of our actual code is under package um, within the origin repo. Uh, and as far as um, Kubernetes goes, like I said, we embed Kubernetes in here. I mean, it's it's used in two ways. So we expose Kubernetes directly. So basically, everything that's in Kubernetes is exposed directly through OpenShift. Um, and it's also the case that we use Kubernetes um, as a set of libraries um, to build our code on top of. Uh, and so, yeah. So if you look under Workspace here, you can see the actual that's the entire Kubernetes code base, which is embedded inside of Origin here. And we tend to to rebase on or basically pulling that dependency um, roughly once a sprint, so roughly every three weeks. Um, now, I, I mentioned the two main ways of developing here um, using uh, either local or using the Vagrant image. Um, there is one, a third way, um, which depending on what kind of develop, development you're doing may be relevant, uh, which is we also publish a Docker image of origin uh, to Docker Hub. And so um, you can always always just do a Docker run on the origin image. I guess it's um, Docker run OpenShift slash origin uh, and be able to do development with OpenShift. So for example, if you're building images um, to run on top of OpenShift, um, that's a very, very simple way to, to do it. Um, it. All of them are still valid if you want to build images, but um, running the Docker image is probably the simplest. Uh, and actually one last thing while I'm in here, um, as far as the, the code base goes, um, we do also uh, do uh, releases of origin. Uh, so basically every time that we are uh, spinning a release of origin, um, there's usually an enterprise release that, that follows it fairly soon after. Um, the version numbers don't match here, but uh, you can get a rough idea of, of what's going to land in the next uh, enterprise release by, by seeing what's happening in, in the, uh, the origin release nodes. Okay, back to the presentation. Okay, so next up, uh, we we certainly accept pull requests. Um, we have a, a number of, of external contributors now to the Origin project, and uh, it's it's uh, the case that you can always submit a pull request for anything you want to see changed. Um, it's also the case that you can um, submit issues for things that you want to see changed but don't necessarily um, have the time or, or skills to uh, to make the change yourself. Um, generally, I would recommend that if you if you want to make a change. Uh, then you probably should ask yourself, you know, are you are you willing to invest the time to make the change first, or do you want to discuss it? I mean, if it's a really small change, then you're probably fine just uh, submitting the pull request with the change and discussing it as part of um, that submission. And if it's a really big change or some sort of, um, you know, re-architecturing or, re or restructuring of of the code, um, rather than than go through all the work to make the change first, I would probably recommend um, submitting an issue to start. Um, against the origin project and discussing it there um, and usually that will, will end up in a solution that everyone is happy with. Okay, so next up here is our, is actually what happens once you do submit a pull request. Um, whenever we, we started the OpenShift project, you know, we, we started with a relatively small group of five or six people, um, roughly five years ago now, and um, at that point in time, we we you know, did what a lot of folks get away with as far as um, continuous integration, which is we you know those five people worked pretty closely together and they submitted code. And um, after the code was submitted, you know a bunch of test cases got kicked off. And you know every once in a while the test cases would break and it would be pretty obvious you know what changed and what 
we would need to go fix to, to fix it. And at some point in time, uh, we realized that, uh, that, you know, once we got to 10 or 15 or so people, um, it was the case that it was always broken because, you know, amongst those 10 or 15 well-intended people, um, someone at some point in time was always going to be breaking, um, breaking the code base. And so we were always in a state basically of the CI system was broken and we had to debug, you know, which of the, which of the 10 to 15 people making changes all day long broke it, which change was it and how do we undo it um, or fix it? And that became a, a pretty, you know, tedious process and was, uh, you know, a pretty big, uh, Pretty big effort on everyone's part to maintain it, and so uh, what we and sort of we sort of view that is um, continuous integration 1.0, and so we we needed to move beyond that, and so uh, there there are some systems now um, which are relatively prevalent like Travis CI, uh, which um, have also sort of moved beyond that, um, and that's sort of what we consider CI 2.0, which is being able to test the code changes against the pull request um, without actually having to merge it. And so uh, we ourselves developed a system to do this very closely integrated with GitHub. Um, there are, are other systems as well, like uh, like Garrett, that that um, give you a way to do this. However, whenever you start using a system like Garrett, uh, you you somewhat have to divorce yourself from the nice GitHub pull request model. Um, so what we did was we developed a, a relatively simple system. And I will say you do not need to read this entire um, diagram here. It's uh, <laughs> there's a lot on the page, which all, all of this is still. Um, exactly what we do, um, but for the purposes of getting involved, you do not need to understand that much complexity. Uh, so yeah, so again, there's systems like um, Travis CI, which uh, have this model of you submit pull request and they go test your code whenever you submit pull request. Um, there are some downsides with Travis CI. In addition to you can't run everything, so um, we can't run Docker actually with Travis CI yet, which limits us on what we can actually test. Uh, the the other big issue with Travis is that it it does not handle a queuing mechanism, and so there's no guarantee that you won't have two people submit code changes that conflict. Um, it also doesn't give you anything more than a point in time. So if someone submits a pull request and it sits there for a week, someone might come along a week later and say, okay, it passed the test, I'm gonna merge it, but that was a week ago and stuff may have changed since then so that if you actually were to run those tests again, they would not pass again. Um, so, uh, it, it, and to be fair, though, we, we actually did develop this even before Travis CI was totally in place. Um, we actually do use Travis CI now, which you'll see on some of the coming pages, um, as sort of a, a first pass, but we do more than that to guarantee that code act that actually makes it into master um, is actually still correct and valid. Um, and so, again, the way we do that is we have a merge queue. That merge queue um, tests and merges one thing at a time. It guarantees that all of the test cases actually pass so that um, you know that there was no delta other than that one pull request. And we completely tested that pull request with what was previously on master. And, we, and basically, you have to wait your turn in the queue before um, you actually get merged. Uh, now, we do have a list of, of trusted users who have um, merge permission. And we'll talk a little bit later about um, testing as well, uh, which um, is a a more expanded list. Um, we actually make it so that almost no one actually has real push, push permission to our repos, uh, which means basically it's, it's difficult for someone to even shoot themselves in the foot and accidentally push something to master. Uh, so it's a, it's a system basically that we develop to make sure that um, we do keep a stable code base at all times, which means that whenever we expand it even beyond the 10 to 15 people, um, we always know that the code that's on master is still valid, um, which keeps all of those people productive. Uh, we didn't build the system with um, with Jenkins, um, as well as uh, a, a decent bit of, uh, of, of scripting um, or, that ties together with Jenkins to provide the functionality. Okay, uh, so uh, this is an example of, of, of pull requests, or at least the, the bits of the pull requests that are relevant here. And uh, this pull request um, is relatively common, right? So you'll have um, someone come in and review a change. And whenever they review the change, they will um, you know, first go through a series of comments, making sure that things are OK. Uh, and once they agree that everything is good, then they will add this merge tag. So you can see the, the um, merge in square brackets here. 
that indicates to the bot that the bot should go in and test the change. Um, and then you see the bot commenting back. So um, the bot will first comment and say it's running the test cases. And then um, at the end of it, it'll if it succeeds, it will actually merge the code. And you see here, in this case, it did succeed. And the bot actually merged that commit in. Uh, there's actually uh, uh, two things here that are, are, uh, are printed. One is from... Uh, one is from Travis and the other one is from our bot. Um, and actually the bot hasn't actually updated this yet, but um, eventually the, whenever I grabbed it at least, but eventually the bot would um, put a check mark here as well. And I mentioned we also have test. Um, test is something which um, quite often uh, people will uh, add before they add merge. So a common use case might be uh, a person would, would um, see a change come in or a pull request come in, and uh, before they go take the time to um, fully review the changes and make sure that everything's okay, they'll first add a test tag um, just to know, like, does it still function? And before they go spend all the time to review it, um, it's useful just to make sure that the person submitting the code actually has um, a valid change before, um, before it's reviewed. Or in, in actuality, our own developers even, uh, we'll often just use this to to validate their own code. Um, it's it's easier in some cases to submit the pull request and have Jenkins run the test cases than it is for them to run all the test cases locally. And in in this example, actually, that you're looking at, um, it's actually the case that the bot actually asked for it to be tested ahead of time. So um, that's a way for while you're waiting in the merge queue for something to actually get merged, um, the bot will. If there is a queue, meaning there's more than one person currently in it, uh, the bot will will ask um, uh, that we run tests against it before we even get to the merge queue. Um, that way, if you are you know fourth or fifth in line, um, you'll get early feedback to know whenever you get to the top of the queue, do you actually have a chance of passing? Okay, so I mentioned before we uh, we do use Jenkins for this. Um, you don't necessarily uh, have to have to uh, be too aware of this. Um, it is a public Jenkins, so all the links that we put um, in the pull request will show up um, as something you can click on. Uh, all of them run through um, a couple of jobs here. So they either run through um, merge pull request origin or test pull request origin here. And so for each one of these, um, you can see that uh, you know, it's going to report um, success or failure. If it does succeed, um, it's going to put a link here to the pull request afterwards. Uh, and for each one, you can click on it and see the logs of what actually happened. Again, this one passed, so the very last thing it did was uh, update the, the particular uh, pull request. So if we actually click on that pull request here, you can see uh, the bot actually reported back that it was successful. And in this case, um, someone six minutes ago actually just added a merge tag, so now it's, uh, it's actually in the process of, of getting merged. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, uh, this is sort of extra credit, um, but just so everyone's aware, um, we do also have a set of extended test cases. Uh, extended test cases, or let me actually let me start with, uh, it is the case that test and merge, we try to be pretty rigid about how long they take. Uh, so we, we generally like for it to be less than 30 minutes. Uh, we tend to get pretty angry when it's over an hour because no one wants to late, wait very long. Um, for their code to get merged. And so, uh, and generally it stays somewhere in between those two boundaries because of that. Uh, and so um, currently we're in the process of trying to get it down and trying to add more test cases to it um, by adding more parallel parallelism to it. Uh, but it's always gonna be the case that we have some set of test cases that take too long to run. So a good example of that would be a reliability test case. So a test case that says, I'm going to you know, drive the system for two hours and make sure that uh, it stays running constantly in a good state for those two hours or pick a longer time period. There technically is no way you can run that in less than two hours, and we can't wait on that for every single merge to happen. And so we fit those into additional buckets of test cases that, that are, are our extended buckets. And it is possible to request those extended buckets to run as part of tests but not merge. And so the general flow would be um, someone would submit a pull request and we would say, okay, this is you know, a, a risky enough change or we know that we have test cases, but they are in extended. And the reviewer would 
add a, a, an additional command here, directive uh, of extended colon, and then the list of buckets. You can add multiple buckets, um, comma separated. In this case, they actually asked ask for all of the test cases to be run, all the extended test cases to be run. Uh, and like I said, we don't block on these for merge, but you can ask for them with test. Um, your test will then take longer um, to actually happen. And then it's the case that after each merge, um, we kick off um, an additional build, I mean, the official build basically for uh, the QE team to look at it. And that official build is, uh, is our, after the official build finishes, we then run the extended test cases uh, to make sure that uh, those are continuously run just after the fact. So it's sort of the, the model that we don't prefer that we originally had that I described before of, of you know, they could break because we're not guaranteeing that we run them ahead of time. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have a way to, to make every single test case run instantaneously. So uh, it's, it's just a reality. Uh, but at least we limit the amount of test cases that fit into those buckets as much as possible. Okay, um, we also do our documentation publicly. Um, so I'll show that real quick here. So um, this is the same documentation that uh, or is generated from the same code uh, that ends up for the origin and, and enterprise and actually online as well documentation. And so this is the, the origin version of it. It's docs.openshift.com for the enterprise version of it. And uh, all of that documentation is generated from um, this OpenShift docs repo. And uh, so it's something that uh, we we like being public because it means that uh, it's very easy for our developers as well as external people to to um, open issues or or pull requests or whatever they um, they wherever they see changes that need to be made. It's very easy for anyone to do it um, rather than hit behind some wall. Okay, and then uh, lastly here, um, actually I will show a little bit more Jenkins, um, but the, the last slide here at least um, I wanted to mention was, uh, we do use two mechanisms. So I mentioned GitHub issues before um, for being able to open bugs. And uh, we also have Bugzilla. Uh, so both of these are valid. Um, we treat them um, relatively equally. So um, this is our issues list in origin. Uh, there's a lot here obviously. Um, and if you want to open bugs against Bugzilla, um, it's under the um, it's under the OpenShift origin or OpenShift Enterprise product. And just make sure um, specify the version. Um, we will change it if you get it wrong, but try to specify the version here um, appropriate to to which one you're asking for a, a or reporting an issue or asking for a feature against. Um, and we have no time here, so I, I will go back and show one quick thing here in in Jenkins, uh, which is. Uh, one of the things actually in that that um, flow chart that I showed before um, is we also have the ability to do something that we call 4 KMIs. So 4 KMIs uh, are one more variation on us being able to um, run um, our test against code before it gets merged into master. And so uh, a very typical use case for a 4 KMI is we've made a major change to the code base and we, we may be able to pass all of our test cases, but things like the reliability of that test, things like um, performance testing, um, more rigorous testing that our QE team may do, um, we don't have a way to get to those um, uh, except for 4KMI. And so um, we basically developed the 4KMI system as a means to be able to uh, be able to submit your code to your branch uh, or your fork in GitHub and then we can create a 4KMI, which creates an official build that our QE team is able to do a full regression against at that point. And so no matter how big the change is, um, it's something that we never want to risk putting risky stuff into master. Uh, and so if you ever do submit a change and it's something where, uh, where it does have some amount of risk to it, um, you may see us go through a 4KMI process with it. Um, you say we do this ourselves on a pretty regular basis. And so uh, it basically just means that we, it, the change is risky enough that we do want to um, allow our QE team to, um, to do a full regression essentially against it um, before, before it does go into master. Um, that's probably the last major piece that, uh, that really is relevant um, to external contributors.
Okay, um, so I think that's uh, the majority of what I wanted to show. So I guess we can we can open up the floor here for uh, questions now. All right, well, thank you, Dan. That was awesome, uh, and and a lot in one um, sitting. So, but I think it's it's a great overview and a great way to, for everybody to get started. I'm looking to see if there's any questions. If there are, if you can type into chat, um, and I'll unmute you if you if you'd like to speak rather than talk. If not, then I expect you're all going to be experts on this and be doing pull requests, logging bugs, and um, fixing them um, very shortly. And, uh, we did get one request to update the OpenShift.org site from Chuck, and um, I, I will definitely say that we are working on a new version of the OpenShift.org site that incorporates the atomic um, pieces as well. So that's happening um, as we speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a question here about uh, when should you open uh, a bug against GitHub um, or a GitHub issue versus a Bugzilla bug? And the answer there is is uh, both are okay. Uh, we uh, internally, our QE team tends to use Bugzilla. Um, externally, more people tend to use GitHub. Um, we treat them both equally from a triage perspective. Um, so every single sprint, we go through the bugs in both lists. Um, to figure out what things need to be fixed for, and if they don't need to be fixed immediately, then they get um, prioritized into a list. Um, so it's really a matter of whatever you're more comfortable with um, is, is the right answer. And if you're very new to at the OpenShift and OpenShift origin, um, Dan did point out the documentation, and that is a great place to even start extending the documentation or asking questions um, to more clarifications on pieces of the documentation that um, aren't up to snuff. And we'll probably uh, ask you for feedback on that and, and get that going because the documentation is one of the key pieces of the project. So if, you, if you're looking for some place to start, um, join us um, in fixing up some of the documentation for V3. And if there's no other questions, then I'm going to really say a big thank you to Dan for doing this. Um, it's very thorough. Um, it'll be up and recorded, so if you want to play it back and look over some of the bits or see the slides, the URLs, it'll be up probably first thing tomorrow morning on the um, commons.openshift.org site. So thank you again, Dan, for doing this, and I think I will try and make this um, a semi-quarterly um, event because we keep having new members coming into the Commons and we need to get up to speed. Great. Thanks very much. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Take care.